live from Atlanta, Georgia, it's theCUBE, covering Ansible Fest 2019. Brought to you by Red Hat. Welcome back, this is theCUBE's live coverage of Ansible Fest 2019 here in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm Stu Min and my co-host is John Furrier and we're going to dig in and talk a bit about developers. Our, right. our guest on the program, Prague Dave, who is a senior principal product manager with Red Hat. Thank you so much for joining us. Glad to be here, thanks for having me. All right, so you know, configuration management uh, really uh, maturing into a, an entire uh, uh, you know, automation journey for, for customers today. Uh, let, let, let's get into it, tell us a little bit about your role and you know, what brings you to the, the yes. event? Yeah, so I actually have a very uh, deep background in automation. I started by doing uh, workload automation, which was basically about how to help businesses do their you know, processing. So, you know, right from processing an invoice, how do I create the flows, right, to do that. And we saw the same thing, like automation was just kind of like an operational thing and was brought on uh, just to fulfill the business, make it faster. And next thing you know, it grew like, like I don't know, like a like wildfire. I mean, it was amazing, and we saw the growth, and we, people saw the value, people saw how easy it was to use, and I think that combination is kicking in. So now I'm focusing more on developers and the yeah. DevTools BU at Red Hat, and it's it's the same thing. Yeah, pa Parag, you know, when you look at IT, you know, automation is not a new term. It's yes. like we've been talking about this for decades. Yep. Talk to us a little bit about how it's different today, and you know, you talked about some of the roles that are involved here. Uh, you know, how, how does how does Ansible end up being a developer tool? Yeah, you know, it's a, it's very interesting because Ansible was never really targeted for developers, right? And in fact, automation was always considered, like I said earlier, like an operational thing. And now, what has happened is the entire landscape of IT in a, in a company is available to be executed programmatically. Now before, it was interfaces were only available for a few programs. Everything else you had to kind of write your own programs to do. And now with the advent of APIs, with, you know, with, with really uh, rich CLIs, it's very easy to interact with anything. And not just like in a software, you can interact with your network devices, with your infrastructure, with your storage devices. So all of a sudden, when everything became available, developers who were trying to run, create applications and needed environments to test, to integrate, saw that automation is a great way to create something that can now be replicated and be consistent every time you run it. So the need for consistency and replication drove developers to adopt tools like Ansible. And we were, like, you know, because at Ansible, we never marketed to developers, and then we see that, wow, they are really pulling it down, it's great. The whole infrastructure as code, which is one of the key pillars for DevOps, has become one of the key drivers for it. Because now what you're seeing is the ability for developers to say that I can now, when I'm done with my coding, and when my application is ready for say a test environment or a staging environment, I can now provision everything I need, right from configuring my network devices, getting the infrastructure ready for it, run my test, bring it down, and I can do all of that through code, right? So that really drives the adoption. And the cloud scale, uh, has shown customers at scale, yes. whether it's on-premises or cloud or edge, is really going to be a big factor in their architecture. The other thing that's interesting, and Stu and I were talking about this on our, our opening yesterday, is, is that you have the networking and the bottom of the stack moving up the stack, and you have the applications kind of wanting to move down, down the stack. So they're kind of meeting in the middle and there's programmability in between them. You know, yes. containers, Kubernetes, microservices, is developing as a nice middle layer between those two worlds. So the networks have to telegraph up data, yes. and also be programmable. This is causing a lot of disruption and innovation. Absolutely. Your thoughts on this, because now it's NetSecOps meets DevOps, that's Net DevOps. Yeah, and then. This is now all of it's coming together. Exactly, and, 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 and what's happening is, what, what we are seeing with developers is that there's a lot more empowerment going on. You know, before there was a lot of silos, there was like a lot of checks and balances in place that kind of made it hard to do things. It was like, okay, this is what you, developers, you write code. We will worry about all this. And now this whole blending that has happened and developers being empowered to do it. And now you, you throw that, okay, the empowerment is great and with great power comes great responsibility. So can you please make sure that you know, what you're using is, is enterprise grade and it's, you know, it's, like, it's like you're not just doing things which will break my environment. So once everybody became comfortable that yes, by merging these things together, we're actually not breaking things, we're actually increasing speed. Because what's the number one driver right now for organizations is speed with security, right? Can I achieve that business agility so that by the time I need a feature developed, uh, by the time I need a feature delivered in production, and my thought comes for it, I need to close that gap. I cannot have a long gap between that. So we are seeing a lot of that happening. People love automation, they love AI. These are two uh, areas that 
it's a no-brainer. When you yep. talk automation, you talk AI, yeah, bring it on, right? Yes. Well, what absolutely. does that mean? <laughs> yeah. So, when you think about automation and the infrastructure, that's in the hands of the operators, but also they want to enable applications to do it themselves as well, hence the DevOps. Where is the automation focus? Because that's the number one question. How do I get land, get the adoption, mm -hmm. and then expand out across? This seems to be the formula that Ansible's kind of cracked the code on. The organic growth has been there. Yes. But now as a large enterprise comes in, I got to get the developers using it, and it's got to be operator friendly. This seems to be the, the key. The balance has to the be key there. The key right? to uh, the kingdom. Yep, no, you're absolutely right. And so you know, when we look at it, like what, what do developers want? So something that's just frictionless to use. Very quick, very easy. And so that I don't have to spend a lot of time learning it and doing it, right? And so we saw that with Ansible. It's like, you know, it, the fact that it's so easy to use, it's most of everything is in YAML, which is what which is very native to developers, right? So we see that for from the dev perspective, they're very eager now, to, and, and they've been adopting it. If you look at the download stats, it tells you, like, you know, there's, there's a lot of uh, f uh, volume happening in terms of developers adopting it. What companies are now noticing is that, wait, that's great, but now you have a lot of developers doing their own thing. So there is no like way of bringing all this together, right? So it's like, if I have 20 teams in one line of business and each team tries to do things their own way, what I'm going to end up with is a lot of repeatable, you know, like a lot of work that gets repeated, that gets duplicated. So we see that's, that's stuff that we're seeing with collections, for example, what, what Ansible is trying to bring to the table is like, hey, how do I help you kind of bring things into one umbrella? And how can I help you as a developer decide that, wow, I got like, you know, 100 plus Nginx roles I can use in Ansible. Well, which one do I pick? You know, and you pick one, somebody else picks something else, somebody creates a playbook with like one separate, uh, you know, one different thing in it versus yours. How do we get our hands around it? And I think that's yeah. where we are seeing From an open source happen. standpoint, obviously Red Hat, Ansible, doing great stuff. Um, and for the folks in, in the ivory tower, the executive CXOs, they hear Ansible, glue layer, integration layer, and they go, wait a minute, isn't that Kubernetes? Isn't mm -hmm. Kubernetes supposed to provide all this stuff? That, yeah. So talk about where Ansible fits in the wave that's coming with Kubernetes. Kubernetes. Pat Gelsinger at VMware thinks Kubernetes is going to be the dial tone. It's going to be like the TCP IP-like protocol, uh, as use his words. But there's a relationship that Ansible has with those microservices that are coming. Can you so, explain that fit? No, that's, you, you, know, you, you hit the nail on the head. Like, Kubernetes is like we're calling the new, the new operating system. It's like that's what everything runs on now, right? And it's very easy for us, you know, from a development perspective to say, great, I have my containers, I have my applications built, I can bring them up on demand, I don't have to worry about, you know, having the whole stack of an operating system delivered every time. So Kubernetes has become like the de facto standard upon which things run. So one of the uh, concepts that has really caught a lot of momentum is the operator framework. Right, and which was introduced, uh, you know, uh, with the Kubernetes, uh, the later release of 3.x. So, uh, what we saw that in the, with an operator framework, it's very easy now for application teams. And we saw a, a great uptake from software vendors themselves. Of how do I give you my product that you can very easily deploy in Kubernetes as a container? But I'll give you enough configuration options so you can make it work the way you want to. So we saw a lot of software vendors creating and delivering their products as operators. Now we are seeing that a lot of software uh, application developers themselves for their own applications want to create operators. It's a very easy way of actually getting your application deployed onto Kubernetes. So Ansible operator is one of the easiest ways of creating an operator. Then there are other options, you can do a Golang operator, you can do Helm, but Ansible operators has become an extremely easy way to get going. It doesn't require any additional tools on top of it. It just requires the operator SDK. It's, you know, you're going to use playbooks, which you're used to already, and you're going to use playbooks to execute your application workflows. So we feel that developers are really going to use Ansible operators as a way to create their own operators, get it out there. Yeah. And this is true for any Kubernetes world. So there's nothing different about you know, an Ansible operator versus any other operator. So no change to Kubernetes, but Kubernetes obviously has the concept of microservices, which is literally non-user intervention. The apps take care of all the exactly. provisioning of services. Yep. This is an automation requirement. Yeah. This feeds into the automation theme, yes, right? Yes, exactly. And, and what this does for you is, it helps you, like if you look at the operator framework, it goes all the way from basic deployment, which everybody's used to. Like, okay, I want instantaneous deployment, automatically just does it. Automatically recognize changes that I give you in my configuration, and go redeploy a new instance the way it should. So how do I automate that? Like how do I ensure that my operator that is actually running my application can set up its own private environment in Kubernetes and then it can actually do it automatically when I say, okay, now go make one change to it. Ansible operator allows you to do that. And it goes all the way into the life cycle, uh, the full five phases of life cycle that we have in the operator framework, which is all, the last one is about autopilot. So auto scale, auto remedy itself. 
your application now on Kubernetes through Ansible can do all that, and you don't have to worry about coding it all. It's all provided to you because of the Ansible operator. Uh, Prague in the demo this morning, I think the, the audience really, uh, it resonated with the audience that they t talked about some of the roles and how they work together. And it was kind of, okay, the developer's on his side <laughs> and the developer's expectation is uh, the infrastructure's not going to be ready, I'm not going to have a need, mm -hmm. leave me alone, I'm going to play my video games um, until I can actually do my work and then, okay, I'll get it done and do my magic. Uh, speak a little bit to how uh, Ansible is helping to you know, break through those silos and having developers be, you know, uh, able to fully collaborate and communicate with all their other team members, uh, not just be off on their own. No, yeah, that's a good point. You know, and, and what is happening is that with, with developers, like with what Ansible is bringing to the table, is giving you a, sim you know, a very prescriptive set of uh, rules that you can actually incorporate into your developer flows. So what developers are now doing is that I can't create an infrastructure configuration without actually having discussions with the infrastructure folks, and the network, or uh, the network team will have to share with me what is the ideal configuration I should be using. Using. So, so the so the empowerment that Ansible brings to the table is enabled cross-team communications to happen, so that there is a prescriptive way of doing things, and you can create this automated end-to-end -end automation, and then just set it up so that it gets triggered every time a developer makes a change to it. So internally, they do that. Now other teams come and say, "Hey, how are you doing this?" Right? And so because they need the same thing. I mean, it's, okay, maybe your, your destinations are going to be different, obviously, but in the end, the mechanism is the same because you are under the same enterprise, right? So you're going to have the same layer of, of network tools, same infrastructure tools. So then teams start talking to each other. I was talking with a customer, and uh, they were telling me that they started with four teams working independently, building their own Ansible playbooks, and then talking to the admins, and next thing they know, everybody had the full automation done, and nobody knew about it. And now they're finding out, and they're saying, wow, I got like hundreds of these teams doing this. So I, I'm, A, I'm very happy, but B, now I would like these guys to talk to each other more and come up with a standard way of doing it. And going back to the collections concept, right? That's what's really going to help them. And we feel that with the collections, it's, you know, if you, it's very similar to what uh, we did with Operator Hub, at, you know, for the OpenShift, is where we have a certified set of collections so that they're supported by Red Hat, we have partners who contribute theirs, and then they're supported by them, but we become a single source. So as an enterprise, you kind of have this way of saying, okay, now I can, feel confident about what I'm going to let you deploy in my environment and everybody's going to follow the same script. And so now I can open up the, you know, the, the floodgates in my entire organization and go for it. Yeah. Uh, uh, what about how are how are uh, people in the community getting to learn from everyone else? When you talk about a platform, it should be if I do something, not only can mm -hmm. my organization learn from it, but potentially you know others can learn for it. That's kind of the the value proposition of SaaS. Yes, yes, it is. And and having the Galaxy offering out there, where we see so many users, you know, like contributing, like we have like close to a hundred thousand roles out there now. And that really brought the Ansible community together. Is It was already a strong community of, of contributors and everything. By, by giving them a platform where they can now have these discussions, where you can see what everybody else is doing, it's, it's the story it is where you will now see a lot more happening. Like today, uh, I think it was um, Ansible is like the top five GitHub projects in terms of pull requests that are happening out there. I mean, we, the community is so vibrant, it's incredible. Like they're driving this change. And it's a community made up of developers, a lot of them. And that's what's you know, uh, creating this amazing synergy between all the different organizations. So we feel that Ansible is actually bringing a lot of this together, especially as more and more automation becomes prevalent in you know, the organizations. All right, uh, Prague, uh, w w want to give you a final word, uh, Antibal Vest 2019, uh, final takeaways. No, this is great, I, you know, this is my first one, and I've never been to one before, and this is the energy and just seeing what all the other partners are also sharing, it's, it's, it's incredible, and like I said, I mean, my background is automation, so I love this, anything automation for me, it's, it's, I think <laughs> that's just the way to go. All right, well, so, Prague, excited. thank you so much for sh sharing the developer angle thank with us. Thank you very us. much. Uh, for John Furrier, I'm Stu Miniman. Uh, back to wrap up from theCUBE's coverage of Ansible Fest 2019. Thanks for watching theCUBE.